G'day everybody. Thank you for joining us today for Changemakers. Changemakers 6, I believe we're actually up to. Today we are going to be talking with Annette Main from the Reconnect Group. And for anybody that took the time to read the little, I guess, write-up, um, I'm really excited about what these guys are doing. I think it's probably something that some people underestimate the significance of. But for anybody um, who doesn't know the Reconnect Group, they essentially provide mobiles and tablets to people uh, in need, whether that's homeless people, refugees, or other people that just can't uh, afford to have a, a tablet or a phone. And I think the youth would certainly understand, but even probably older people would get it that nowadays, We've become so reliant on our devices. You know, that's probably, I guess, not always a good thing, but it is the state of play. And if you don't have something that can help you to navigate your way around and to be in contact with people, to make emergency calls, uh, find your way to a job interview, etc., you know, it really is quite debilitating. And I'm sure we'll get into more of the details of that um, with Annette. But yeah, look, I, I just... Um, it excited me when I read about what they were doing because the people who know what my broader mission is with Flicks for Good um, in terms of providing world-class entertainment education to the world um, for free is that someone who is in a, uh, an underprivileged situation or they might be in another country, they could get their hands on a phone and they could get access to the internet and then they could learn and they could get upskilled and they could have an opportunity to figure out ways to change their circumstances. So, I mean, I'm constantly on my phone listening to podcasts, audio books, watching things on YouTube, things like this, you know, uh, connecting with communities around the world. So it's... Um, yeah, it's become really, really important. Well, that's enough of me yammering on there. Let's get Annette in and we can actually hear uh, the story from her. Hi, Annette. Hey, Brad. How are you? I'm pretty good today, actually. Yeah, how are you? And I've just realised I didn't have my headphones in myself after <laughs> saying, hey, look, make sure Is that better? Have... Headphones, that's definitely better, yes. I, I believe everybody else would be able to hear you fine, so that's uh, so that's okay. I can see that we've got someone with us live. Oh, g'day, Blake, Chef Blake. Good afternoon, he's saying, oh, yeah. I think that he maybe is having a little jab at the fact I was a fraction late. Hey, look, hey, 12, 12 p.m. is one of those funny times of the day. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, but thanks for joining us, Blake. Appreciate uh, appreciate you being here. So. Annette, for people who, I guess, don't know you and don't know the Reconnect Group, can you please give us a bit of a rundown on who you are and uh, what you guys are, are up to? Yeah, sure. Uh, I've been working in waste and recycling programs for the last 17 years um, on a range of different initiatives. I've worked with councils and small businesses and charities all finding ways to reuse, reduce and ultimately recycle any way to avoid things from going to landfill. Um, my background is actually in PR and communications and community education. So I don't actually have the technical skills for, for things like mobile phone repairs, but I, I'm aware of the processes and, and how that all comes about. Uh, I think for me that my, my passion is about um, well, my passion is waste. I, I, can, I, can talk, I can talk garbage all day <laughs> if you really wanted me to. Um, it's, I, just can't, I just can't handle the idea of things being wasted and landfill to me is a really dirty word. So I find ways in which we can make a change with that. And e-waste in particular, electronic waste, is the fastest growing contributor to landfill in Australia. Uh, and, and that's just... An astonishing figure but that's the rise of, of how much electronic equipment and uh, gadgets and things that we we have and the speed at which we're turning over them and and um, buying a new one when a new model comes out or something's updated yeah. so that's what has led me down the path of the reconnect project I was doing some work with an organization that 
um, imports the spare parts for mobile phone repair and I was helping develop some training programs to actually uh, teach people how to repair mobile phones and tablets and for that to work I, I needed a supply of essentially broken phones and tablets that through the repair course people would learn how to fix and then I thought well at the end I've, I've got these fixed phones and, and devices so why don't I find a way of actually getting them into the hands of people that don't need that people getting them out of the hands of people that don't need them and into the hands of people that do need them mm, and mm. hence the reconnect project was born and uh what sort of year was this for... sorry to jump in but what what kind of year were you at well that's so... what I was just about to say we're only just celebrating okay. our our one year anniversary all oh, right wow okay awesome <laughs> yeah yeah uh so we um I, I launched uh in September last year with support from City of Parramatta Council here in Sydney right. at a Pitch for Good event uh, in Parramatta, which uh, then led into a crowdfunding campaign which got um, got the first hit of money, about $5,500, and that then went to getting the first 50 phones and devices repaired. Because on, on average, for the whole process, it costs us around $100 to bring a device uh, back to life, essentially. So that's, right. yeah, that's, that's essentially how it all, it all came about. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. So, um, so you've been on this sort of journey, I guess, or war against, uh, against waste for, for a while now, or it sounds like, um, probably throughout the course of, uh, throughout the course of your, your life. I mean, at what yeah. point did you, I guess, start to really think about that, that, that side of things is it something that you cared about you know as a child or is there something more that's kind of was there a catalyst moment i guess that made you really start thinking more deeply about you know the state of play with um with waste and and what's going on in the world yeah sure the i i grew up in a family of of fixers and menders my father is a carpenter and a builder mm. my mother's a primary school teacher and a dressmaker and so I, was, I grew up in an environment where everything was repaired uh, or made from scratch. Uh, and my grandfather was also always in his, on his shed. And so my father's garage is like that archetypical old man's shed full of bits and pieces and, you know, screws and bolts and all kinds of equipment and things. And, and when I was a teenager, he taught me how to restore furniture. Uh, in the school holidays, I used to do little bits of work for him, painting timber frames on, on windows for jobs he was working on. And uh, when I was about 14, he taught me how to restore a, a beautiful set of um, cedar Australian timber drawers, um, a tall boy that had been kicked around from farm to farm and the, the drawers had been nailed in every time they moved. And, and that first stroke of, um, of the oil going on to the timber once we'd stripped back all the paint and, and you know 60 years of grime and whatever and the color came out of this timber and I was hooked yeah uh, so beautiful. so for me it was it was very much the environment in which I grew up um, yeah. but there was also a, a, a couple of, of I guess key inputs that really set me on this path um, one of them was I grew up watching the good life uh, the the British a sitcom about the the couple that want to try and become sustainable and, and off grid within central London, and I think that had a, quite a lasting impact on on me. But also, when I finished my communications degree, and I was working for a, um, a multinational beauty company actually, yeah. and and essentially it was my job to promote uh, expensive soap and and body lotion and, and toiletry products, and I just. I just got to a point where I had a crisis of conscience, where I just couldn't do it anymore. I, right. One day I was, I was looking at this box of fancy soap and I thought, this, this piece of soap is wrapped in special waxed paper, it's in its own little cardboard box, then it's in, packed into a th set of three as a, as a gift pack, and then six of those are packed into a cardboard box. And then another six of those are packed into a bigger box. And that's how they're getting shipped out to the, the stores and things. I can't do this anymore. Yeah. I, can't, yeah. I just can't do it. <laughs> so yeah. um, I was living in London at the time. Uh, and... It's funny you say that because I was just, I think that they, 
Yeah, when I first went to the UK and my sister was living over there, this was maybe 10 years ago, I don't know, forgive yeah. me, Narelle, if you're watching this, I've probably got your whole, how long you've been married, completely wrong. But, um, you know, it was quite some time ago, let's just say that. And, uh, yeah, I just remember going and buying, like, something maybe equivalent to Tim Tams, like just some, I think it was a packet of some sort of yeah. biscuits or something. And it was like you said, there was like a, a cardboard uh, box and then inside the cardboard box there was kind of like a plasticky layer like what we have. And then inside that, all the individual biscuits were all wrapped in their own little plastic yeah. layer. So I was just like, oh my goodness, what's going on here? Yeah, it's crazy. And and so I, 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 I just had this, yeah, this crisis of conscience and I thought I can't. I can't keep flogging expensive soap to people that don't really need it. That's packaged, over packaged to the mm. extent that there's so much waste in it. Yeah. Uh, and so I convinced a, a small environmental charity in London to to take me on and essentially took four steps backwards in my career and, and, and pay grades uh, to start working on uh, a recycling program within London. And the first thing they, they asked me to do was work with supermarkets on uh, on shelf uh, signage to try and encourage people to buy items that were in recyclable packaging. Because mm. at that point in time, London didn't really have curbside recycling systems like we do right. in Australia. Uh, and, and, and from that, I, I, I was, I'd found my tribe, I'd found my people, I was where I, was where I wanted to be. And, and I, just, I just took off from there. So um, back in, a, you know, that was, gosh, 2002 to 2005 um, and then that here in Australia I continued working on on some recycling programs and um, have worked with a social enterprise and charity in Sydney called the Bower Reuse and Repair Centre which is a fabulous okay. initiative uh, that stops things from going to landfill yeah and and within that I started to see the rise in electronic waste and and was yeah given this opportunity to work on mobile phone repairs and here it all mm. is. Yeah, yeah. It's um. Oh, I, I I always feel myself kind of torn in these situations because I and I, I I've got this on my Twitter profile. Yeah, I'm kind of part tech junkie because I do. I've always been kind of drawn to new interesting things that are happening in technology and I blame my dad for that because he was really into computers so we you know we had like the Apple IIe back in the day and you know then sort of growing up from there and because uh, he was a prize school principal so he put a lot of um, technology into schools which you know there's great parts of technology and I mean you know look at us right here right now we're yeah. um, you know we're live streaming <laughs> a, a broadcast across multiple channels and we can um yeah, we can chat to people. Uh, uh, Blake's saying, what's he saying? I actually sent Daryl an angry email because they started individually wrapping their chocolate licorice logs. How much packaging do you need? Uh. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah, I mean, this is exactly right. There's, um, it's, I mean, one thing, I think it's kind of good at, uh, my, at my daughter's school, uh, they have a set up there where, I don't know, this might be universal, but, um, everything you put in the lunchbox has to just go in there like mm -hmm. without any wrapping so you have to have like containers and and stuff like that um yes so on the one side technology you know lets you do great things and uh but then on the other side yeah i i'm i'm guilty too like i probably don't see out a full term on a mobile phone contract you know um because i like to have something new and I, the iphone 11 or whatever we're up to now has some great cameras and I'm interested in filmmaking. So, you know, that's great. But then, like, uh, like I literally, I believe, oh, where are they? I don't know, because my daughter's been on my case. Well, there's one. So there's, there's one there's one unused, like, old older phone. And I've, I know I've got a couple in the drawer that have got broken screens because yeah. my daughter wants me to convert one into, like, a little gaming sort of thing. And yeah. I just don't know... I haven't taken the time to read up about how I can strip away any of the ways that it could possibly be used to connect to the outside world because she's only uh, nine and I don't really want her communicating to the internet. But so, yeah. and she doesn't get that. She just thinks that I'm lazy, you know, and why don't you do it? And, uh, and I'm just, uh, anyway. So, so the repair, so the repair, so you're saying it's about $100 to, to repair the average phone. Is that right? 
Well, look, that's across a whole spectrum of things. So I just, I just thought I'd show you. I'm still using an mm. iPhone 5, 5C. Right. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And, that might be and the it's one I was just holding. <laughs> yeah. It's working just fine for me. And a lot of people laugh at me because yeah. I am now working on mobile technology and, and they're like, why don't you upgrade? And I said, well, it still serves me just fine. It does what I, I, I need to do. Uh, but in, on, the, on the point of, of, you know, the average cost of repairing a phone. So here's some that have been donated for the mm. Reconnect project. Mm -hmm. um, this one. Absolutely didn't need anything done to it at all. It's a, awesome. it's an iPhone 6 yeah. and uh, my technicians wiped it and uh, tested it all and it's perfectly fine, ready to go. This one, however, have a look at that one. Yes. You can see it's it's, it's actually even bent. Oh, my top. goodness, yes. <laughs> it's, it's seen uh, better it's, days, that's for sure. It's literally been run over by a truck. <laughs> You know, it literally has. This is a, oh, I think it's a Samsung S6. <laughs> And so something like that, hopefully the logic board, the memory board right inside is still going to be fine. Because mm. if it is, then we can bring this back to life. Wow. Uh, if we get donated phones that the logic board isn't okay, well, then we can harvest the other parts for it. Mm. Mm. And this is where the right to repair devices very much comes into play and has mm. been um, a big issue with Apple in the US and there's been some uh, lawsuits filed Oh, wow. Around, yeah. you know, them not allowing devices to um, to have the iOS updates come mm. through. And so it's essentially planned obsolescence, which is a term that's been around for a long time. Um, but Apple was m enforcing it, making it happen. So these devices, even though they still worked, would no longer be able to be updated. And that was it. Uh, and they yeah. also weren't making it available for individuals to be able to repair their own devices. And repairing a mobile phone um, is, isn't for the faint hearted. It's mm. it, 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 very delicate. You have to be very delicate. Um, you know, if you're using tiny tools and, and tiny screws that are like one and two millimeters in length, you know, this is <laughs> wow. pretty microscopic stuff. Mm. But mm. Um, so yes, on average, $100 for us to to get the parts. So we work with a wholesaler to obtain the spare parts or we mm. we Frankenphone. Um, Frankenphone. That's my that. term. Ah, oh, that's a great one. <laughs> uh, to get broken bits from a number of different phones and put them all together to build one working phone. Um, so it, it really goes to show that people, people don't realise that they are still actually a viable working device. And I know that some people sign up for mobile phone contracts where at the end of it, you'll own the phone and then, and then the, the contract rolls over and you just get given the new one. Um, but I haven't done that. I purchased my iPhone 5C outright. And I'm still using it and going going fine with it. Mm. But you will find that you know most people do have uh, you know a, a couple of phones in a drawer or a box or stuff in the garage somewhere. I mean, I think the the, the information from Mobile Muster, which is the national recycling scheme for mobile phones, uh, estimated that there was 23 million unused phones uh, a few years ago sitting around in Australia in in, in drawers and cupboards and things, um, and that's 23 million yeah, 20, phones. That, 23 yeah, million? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That was their <laughs> estimation based on the, the, you know, the turnover of phone sales and yeah. um, number of phone sales in Australia. And that's a yeah. phenomenal amount. Yeah, that's just phones. So add yeah. add tablets to it, iPads yeah. and, and, and Android tablets, and add laptops to it. Mm. And you start thinking, gosh, there's a phenomenal amount of resources out there that are actually still able to be used. Uh, yeah. And, and and with just a little bit of bit a little bit of love, uh, yeah. can be fixed fixed up and ready for someone to use. So yeah, yeah. So I mean, um, yeah. Well, I guess this is where like this is where that other side of me, which is the hippie side, because I was saying before, I'm kind of part tech junkie, part hippie. Yep. The other side is you know, um, I was fortunate enough to grow up in the country in uh, New South Wales in little towns, and then I lived it. Bellingham, which is near Coffs Harbour, which is like one of the original hippie destinations, yep. you know, like where lo lo lots of people went to. And um, so there's lots of people there who are obviously really into um, all sorts of things, sustainable living and what have mm -hmm. you. And that's going back 
I mean, show my age, but it's over 20 years ago, you know, that I, <laughs> that I finished high school and, and um, went out adventuring around and, and left there. But I do, and I love the planet, you know, I love the world, I love the people in the world, and that's part of why I'm interested in doing this. I want to meet more people like yourself and hopefully find other people, you know, who are uh, also interested in change um, yeah. and wanting to do something good. And I've, I've been really just pleased that I have been able to find those people here and overseas and uh you know even just the uh the group that i jumped onto last night you know i was really i hadn't been part of that group i joined and then i posted and then there was 10 or more different people who've all sort of uh jumped up so that's really exciting um and i'm looking forward to spending a bit more time there and um what was the name of that group by the way uh, uh social enterprises just social enterprises uh, social uh, the Facebook Australia. Group. Yeah. yeah yeah uh so yeah i mean because some people don't even know what a social enterprise is in fact my accountant um because i went and i said oh, okay like you know flicks for good which is my kind of venture yeah. that i'm working on this video streaming service um they yeah they didn't know what it was and i because i did explain to them like it kind of doesn't have its own official no. legal designation for whatever reason but you can attach it to a not-for-profit or you can attach it to a uh, for profit, but essentially, for anybody who doesn't know what a social enterprise is, a social enterprise is basically a business, or some people call it profit for purpose. You know, there's a business that has to at least give 50% of the money that they, the profit that they make, sorry, not the money they make, the 50% of the profit that they make to different the causes that they believe in. Um, yep. And then they can do other, you know, different things different things um in the u.s there's the b corp i think some 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 companies in australia perhaps they've got the b corp certification um yep yeah and that's just a set of rules that you basically adhere to and then they kind of monitor it and then give you a stamp of approval and so then as more people get aware it is good i think ben and jerry's they're probably one of the bigger ones patagonia they're a b corp australia has thank you water they're probably the most famous one and who, make, uh, who gives a crap who gives a crap? Yeah, see, I love it. Like, often people, I think, have a good sense of humour. Um, so tell me more about, I guess, yeah, your involvement with um, within the social enterprise space. Have you had much to do with any other uh, or had the, 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 the opportunity to meet with any other um, founders? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I've um, been working within social enterprises in Australia since 2015. Mm. Um I was the, the communications manager for the Bauer here in Sydney, and the Bauer is quite a well-known social enterprise in Sydney. Uh, it was yeah. featured on the War on Waste because the Bauer brought uh, the concept of repair cafes to Australia back in uh, 2014. And that's a, a, a community initiative where people come and get advice or assistance on repairing items uh, with, with people who volunteer their time. So there's repair cafes popping up all over Australia. Uh, but our repair cafe at the Bower in Sydney was featured on um, the ABC doco series War on Waste with Craig Recastle a couple of years ago. Uh, so I, I spent a lot of um, in my time at the Bower. I, I set up a program called From House to Home, which uh, then went on to win the community building, um, community building program uh, award at the New South Wales Office of Environment Awards in 2016 and was then thank you but it was then selected also to win the overall Premier's Award for Environment that year and mm. and it's the same principle as to what I'm now doing with the Reconnect project and House to Home uh, was an initiative where I'd been um, helping some friends who were involved in the Mums for Refugees uh, advocacy group and I've been helping them drive around on hard rubbish days collecting furniture and things that they could provide to families who were being released from detention in, in Villawood and being mm. put into community housing but had no way of accessing furniture and things. So we mm. were, mm. I was helping them and then, uh, I thought to myself, you know, this is this is nuts. I'm, I'm working for an organisation that has access to a truck, that has agreements with 21 councils to pick up furniture. We have these systems in place. All we need to be able to do is cover the costs of making it happen. Mm. And and hence, House to Home was, was born. And that program has expanded now to also support uh, victims of domestic violence um, mm. and 
uh, homeless people that have been homeless and are, are transitioning into social housing or supported accommodation. And that works on the same principle. The bow is, is donated masses of furniture, things that people don't need anymore. They work with caseworkers in, in different organisations to get that furniture then out to people. And those people get the dignity of choosing those, those furniture items. And that to me mm. is a really important part when it comes to a social enterprise. Is there's, there's, you know, there, there may be um, a primary objective for the social enterprise, but there's often subsidiary or, or side objectives as well. And for me, in, environmental work has, has been my driver, but I have a very strong sense of social justice, uh, and I always have. Um, I was the person who would who would chase the the bullies down the street because they were throwing rocks at my neighbour, um, <laughs> you know. And and I, I just I just can't. I can't handle seeing the injustices like that. So I, uh, my mother said, yeah, I was always, always that way inclined. Uh, the kid had, I, I actually, I remember in kindergarten and uh, they, they said to us, oh, Christmas time, you, you bring a toy in for a child that doesn't have one, um, you know, the program. And I literally thought they had to ch that you chose one of your own toys and, and you gave that to the school to give to another child and my mum found me in my, my bedroom crying because I had had a number of stuffed toys out in front of me and I couldn't decide which one to choose to give away but I really wanted to give one because the idea of there being a child that wasn't going to receive something on Christmas at Christmas was was quite upsetting mm. and my mum explained to me oh no no it's okay we'll, we'll actually go and we'll we'll get one from the shop or we'll make something or, you know, we'll, we'll do it that way. And so this strong sense of the haves and the have nots and, yeah. and, and the, you know, the, the divide in wealth around the world. I mean, that's a whole topic that yeah. we, could, we could go on for hours, but, uh. but that's, I guess the, the secondary um, driver for me is, well, one, I don't want to see stuff going to waste unnecessarily. Yeah. There's enough resources for us to continue reusing things. Um, and two, oh, why can't we help people that genuinely need help? I mean, exactly. for a refugee that that arrives, and, and at the moment there's um, there's some legislation or, or things being put forward to stop refugees in detention having access to mobile phones, which I mm. think is mm. incredibly cruel. Uh, mm. Because how else are you supposed to contact family or friends you know mm -hmm. how else are you supposed to have a connection still to the world um and that again that's that's just it for me a mobile phone and you said in your intro very w mm. excellent intro you know a mobile phone is is imperative now if you want to apply for a job um, a mobile mm. phone could be used to keep in contact with centrelink and essential services a mobile phone um, is like a mini computer in your pocket it can contain you know whole load of information and packages and programs and apps and things that that mean that you don't necessarily need to have a full full computer so for for someone who ha has been settled into australia has been released from um you know detention is put into community environment what's the first thing you'd want to do if if you were in that situation well, you surely you'd want to contact your family and say mm. i'm i'm safe i'm yeah, okay yeah, exactly you know and have a means of communicating with them yeah. Um, you know, and, and whilst we we might love it, we might hate it, but they're here to stay. And, yeah. and mobile technology is, is just developing at such a fast uh, rate. Mm. And whilst we keep adopting new technologies, which again, you know, credit to what we're being able to do here today, mm. it just leaves the trail it leaves behind. Uh, ha the, there's an opportunity there. So yeah. the first, actually the first mobile phone that um, the Reconnect project gave to someone was uh, a refugee who's in community detention in, right. in um, uh, up, up, around, up around the Hornsby area and yeah. in Sydney. That was the first one. And then the next 20 phones went to the women's community shelters. So for, with the rise of COVID and, and and, and people seeing the increase in, in domestic violence and calls for help. If, mm. if you're someone, you know, fleeing a situation of family violence, you need a, t a device or a way of, of communicating with people that isn't being tracked or traced yeah. by, mm. by by your, the abuser. Um, mm. And often when people flee those situations, they're, they're walking out with, with nothing and, and, and mm. can't be sure if their phone is actually safe to use. 
Um, yeah, traumatising, yeah. really, isn't it? I mean, my wife and I were watching, we were watching a program uh, a little while ago that oh, I feel bad now because I can't re- think of the name. But off the top of my head, Blake might know. He's pretty good with that sort of thing. But uh, it was, I'm sure, it was probably an ABC thing, and it was just basically going into maybe it was like riches riches to rags or something oh, where the homelessness one on SBS yeah homelessness yeah it's where they, they the, where they take people and they put them into um, living living life as a homeless person for yeah a, different a week situations or two weeks. like whether yeah. it was on the street or whether yep. it was in a um, boarding house a boarding house which mm-hmm. is still like terrifying the boarding house mm-hmm. was probably scarier. Um, and now since I've tuned into that, I've heard somebody else telling a story about going to one of those boarding houses. Actually, no, it was um, Simon, Simon Finnick, who I re- uh, interviewed. So I was originally running this show on Instagram Live, and I've just recently transitioned to doing YouTube and, and mm-hmm. Facebook. Um, but uh, he... Um, yeah, he basically got caught in caught up in crime. Well, he basically ended up turning to an ice addict and got caught up in crime and was became a dealer and like just the whole story of you know going right down the drain and then ended up in jail. But then when he came out of jail, um, yeah, he said he turned up at a boarding house and the the person who was running the joint was off her face on something and you know mm-hmm. basically the, all the you know pointing to rooms down the thing and it's like you know there's doors hanging out of the wall and just you think wow but uh yeah i remember we would watch that and one of the one of the scariest things in that was probably there was a mum and a couple of kids who they were actually in a house but i think the house was they were going to have to leave the house they were only able to be there for a while um but they had fled a domestic violence situation mm-hmm. and they were, you know, on the cusp of potentially ending up out on the street. And you think, well, that's just, you know, like it can't be that way. Like or the fact that it is that way, but like it, it shouldn't be because it's yeah. bad enough if someone's trying to get out of such a horrible situation, let alone to think that they might be doing so to, you know... Um, not know what's going to become of themselves. So that's a, yeah, terrifying, um, terrifying mm. sort of scenario or just a really, yeah. Yeah. So within that that divide between the have and the have not, um, you know, there's also an, an increasing digital divide happening in Australia. Mm. And COVID has really highlighted that as well, that people that, and, and the digital divide, divide talks um in relation to a person's ability to connect digitally. So whether they have access to a device and whether they have access to a um, suitable internet. So the NBN rollout it has, has been working towards reducing the access side of things, but then there's still the app um, being able to, to have a device. Um, and, and COVID has really highlighted that to people because all of a sudden you had people trying to do schooling from home and and a number of kids, you know, mm. in the families that just don't have the means to be able to buy a tablet or a laptop, mm. Mm. you know, for their kids to use. Um, yeah. And at school it's provided, but in the home setting, not necessarily. So, yeah. you know, in, 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 a, in a backwards kind of way, COVID has, has shown how the importance of programs like the Reconnect Project have in our society to be able to you know, keep people connected, um, particularly at times when we're being forced to isolate uh, mm. from other people. And then mm. that you know, leads into a whole range of mental health issues um, around, around isolation. And then at the end mm. of that, when we're all coming back uh, into society again, how is that all going to play out for people? Um, so, so the online space and, and having the ability to access that uh, is really important now. And, and certainly you're looking at situations, you know, between Queensland and New South Wales where people aren't able to physically visit each other because of the, the border closure. Or if we didn't have, um, you know, FaceTime app, apps and things, then how, how else would people be able to visually see? They could still, you can mm. still pick up the phone. Mm. Um, but now in some areas, you know, landlines are on the decline. It, it, there needs to be suitable mobile coverage. Mm-hmm. Um, 
around Australia too. So there's a whole range of issues yeah. that can come into, you know, understanding that divide digitally in Australia mm. and how how we can can help with that. So I've actually had um, I've had a number of businesses that have come together uh, and done a little donation drive within their organisation. Uh, okay. And people have gone through the drawers and the cupboards at home and and brought in their spare laptops and tablets and phones and and these organisations have boxed them all up and sent them sent them to us and and that's fabulous. Mm. I mean that mm. that kind of support. The support actually I've received has has been wonderful. Um, people are yeah. really encourage uh, really positive, really encouraging. Yeah. Uh, about the reconnect project um, the questions that I get asked is but what about my data um, and okay. you know you know what what's going to happen to that and we use military grade software um, specialist software that erases everything mm. uh, we, we're not interested uh, you know not totally <laughs> not interested in accessing <laughs> what people have got on their phone so even yeah. if the phone is as as beat up and broken as as that one, you know, it's still possible for us to repair it, completely wipe all the data, reset it, um, and then it's good to go. And I think that's the key distinction between uh, reusing um, mobile phones and tablets to reusing laptops as well, uh, because okay. mobile phones and tablets all come with uh, built-in software. So it's either the, the iOS or it's the Android operating system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whereas laptops, once we completely erase that, well, then we need to be able to reinstall mm. uh, Windows or, or Apple operating systems onto Macs yeah. and things. And that comes at a cost to us. Um, mm. So hence, hence why, um, you know, we say around, again, back to that $100, it also covers the cost of providing a charger um, yeah. with the phone and things. But, you know... Yeah. Data security is is really important, um, mm. and we're not interested in what's actually on people's phones or yeah. tablets or laptops. We're <laughs> just probably interested don't want to. Probably don't oh. want to see who knows. You, who knows, oh, who, what knows? You're find. who knows what you've got in there? I don't want to see your, your photos <laughs> from your holidays or whatever. You know, it's just not. It's not. It's not of interest to me. Um, yeah. And and so far, uh, we've. Um, doing some programs at the moment supported by the City of Sydney Council mm -hmm. and that's working with the YWCA in Sydney, uh, the Women and Girls Emergency Centre in Redfern and Counterpoint Community and Multicultural Services in Waterloo. And that's a six month program to provide up to 300 devices to people um, in the inner Sydney um, quite low socioeconomic areas around Waterloo and Redfern and Alexandria. So mm. um, we're getting laptops for, for girls who are participating in a mentorship program through the, the Women and Girls Emergency Centre, um, phones for people who um, are experiencing trans are in transitional housing um, and have no other way of being in contact with people, um, yeah. and devices to elderly isolated people within um, the social housing tenements in in Waterloo, the big housing estates in there. So that's mm. that's a fantastic initiative, and so we need mm. you know people to be donating uh, their devices so that we can work with those organisations uh, yeah. to to get them out. And also, as I've got a similar one happening in the Parramatta region in Western Sydney, um, supported by Parramatta Council, and that's working with Parramatta Mission and the Parramatta Women's Shelter to again get devices out to people who need them. Um, yeah, but awesome. We, yeah, so it, I'm working the, with... Sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, what's the best way for people to get in contact with you or get a device to you? So for people who are watching this, whether it's now or whether it's into the future, um, because most of the viewers that I have typically watch this at a later time, which is yep. understandable because lots of people are at work or in bed or whatever it is, depending where they are in the world. I mean, yeah. people overseas. It's, I'm assuming at the moment your focus is in, in um, is in Australia. Australia. Yeah. But so, how do people get it uh, to you? Like, what's the website? So, I might pop that up on the screen. Yeah, if you pop the website up, and people can go to that. There's a there's a, a page on there that says connect, uh, yep. and that has or, or donate, and that has all the information about where you can 
physically drop off devices at the moment here in Sydney uh, or how you can you can post them to us or we have a reply paid um, that people can use to to package up and send things send things to us so we're getting devices from all across Australia um, yeah. people are finding out about us and where possible if I've got um, if I've got someone interested in running a donation drive themselves in a local community or, or in a specific region, what I'm trying to do is then also find uh, organisations in in that general district that can benefit from receiving those devices once we've cleaned them up and refurbished them. So trying to keep things um, local to a degree and and keep you know communities supporting their own community. So if anyone wants to run a donation drive where they are the central point collecting all the all the devices, then please, um, you know, feel free to, to get in touch. Oh, great, you've got there on the screen the donation yeah. drop-off points. And, and we're looking for more <laughs> donation drop-off points as well. Um, we tend to work with organisations that can have something, um, you know, behind the counter maybe just to make sure people... Um, who might be concerned about dropping off a phone or a tablet somewhere, have that security knowing that that device is actually going to the end purpose that it's meant to be. Um, yeah. So, and yeah, whatever condition they're in, whatever age, we'll take them. So. Yeah, well, um, <laughs> hold up the other phone, because I've noticed we've got a couple of other people, so hold up that beat up phone again so people yeah. can see <laughs> you know, just how bad it is, because I, I guess, there we I go. Mean, have a look at, yeah, look at that thing. So, I mean... <laughs> that's an extreme example. That's, that's that extreme. is extreme. Oh, hang on. Sorry, put it back up. I'll put you back onto the full screen. There you go. So now <laughs> I can, people can see better. Yeah, that one's been run over. So. But that one, that one, uh, that iPhone came to us in in okay, excellent condition. condition. So yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll take them regardless. It, you know, any any Android or, or iPhone, it doesn't... It really doesn't matter, and it doesn't matter the age of it. If it's something that we can't refurbish and reuse, then uh, we will have it um, recycled. So there is a national mobile phone recycling scheme called Mobile Muster, and uh, but none of the phones actually get reused through that program. Um, so, but they securely destroy all of it, and then there's actually quite a lot of rare metals and valuable. Um, components within a mobile phone that they can then extract and that then mm. gets reused so and there on the screen you've got gogo gokan yeah. gokan's yeah. the tech uh that works go, for go. me <laughs> and yeah and uh he's done some specialist uh training in micro soldering skills which is um wow. soldering you know one millimeter size little micro chips and things onto onto the logic boards within a mobile phone uh, so it's, uh, hands as steady as a surgeon he has. amazing, yeah. It's going to put people like me and my soldering skills to shame, that's for sure. <laughs> it's <laughs> I the tried it's to the solder really... something recently. It was a disaster. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I jumped on YouTube and I thought, oh, cause I, I, I broke the jack like on my um, on some headphones. So I thought, oh, yeah, I'll just get this other one from these headphones that don't work and the, the jack piece is fine and I'll just get that across and... I don't know what I did. I, I thought it was going to be pretty straightforward, but uh, yeah, no, it um, <laughs> they're not working. So um, yeah, one me one millimeter. Wow, amazing. So good. I just yeah, I just think it's such a great um, I think it's such a great uh, thing. Are there any just while actually while I've got the website here, anything yeah. else here that you think would be good to show people? Uh, I think the, the the main thing is is that. Um, you know, we, we're actively looking for um, project partners, I suppose. So mm. on the on the page that says who we can help um, or who we help, it's actually very little information. That one's a work in progress. And that's where yeah. we'll be updating with the different organisations that we're supporting and working with. And, and eventually there will be a section on there too where people can actually purchase a refurbished device from us. So that then provides us with... Um, that money towards repairing uh, the phones that can 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 be then given to people in need. So mm. 
it's an ethical way or a socially conscious way of, of mm. getting a device to, you know, even if it's for for your kids um, once mm. they hit high school or whatever and, or you're looking mm -hmm. for something quick, um, then we'll be offering that too so that, again, it, it as a social enterprise, it's providing us with an income to be able to do the actual social component that we're wanting to do, which is to, you know, get devices into the hands of people that need them um, that yeah. otherwise wouldn't be able to access them. Um, yeah, yeah. So um, what, uh, if you don't mind me asking, because I think it's good for people to understand and, you know, part of the reason I'm running these different series I'm running is that I want, I suppose I, I, one thing I just, I, I really like the process of sparking ideas and I see how stuff happens in my own mind and you see one thing here and then you think, oh, that could be used over here. And I think a lot of the great things that we've seen coming out in, in recent times have often been some, have transplanted some sort of system or a model from one area and just plunked it over into a, another area. Um, so, but I also like, I suppose people about to be educated from the ground up so that they can sort of go, okay, well, how would I even start? You know, because I think mm -hmm. sometimes, and I, I don't know the stats, there'll be some statistician out there, if anybody watching knows, you know, and put it in the comments like, you yeah, in the future when you're, watching this later on um if somebody knows the stats but uh i think a lot of people who are probably a bit more socially conscious if you want to call it that or lean towards doing something in social enterprise not for profit what have you uh don't always have a bucket load of cash themselves so yeah you might have a great you might have a big heart but you don't have a big yeah. uh, bank balance so how um I guess it sounds like you've had a bit of grant money come in. Like, how have yeah. you guys, I guess, functioned for, from that regard so far? Yeah, so I guess when starting up a social enterprise, you need to make sure that you've got enough seed funding to, to get you up and running. And then that you actually, a social enterprise is, is different to a charity that is solely reliant on donations. Social enterprise is actively selling um, goods or a service in order to derive an income that then supports the social aims of that organisation. So you have to you have to not think like a charity and you have to think like a business. And I think that's where um, starting out a lot of small um, charity uh, um, social enterprise groups struggle uh, because they don't have a marketable product or service to be able to give to someone. I'm on the board of a, a local food rescue organisation in my area called the Crateful Group. And it very much is, um, it's been operating kind of like under the radar uh, for the last seven years. And we've only in the last, <coughs> excuse me, two years become a registered entity and are registered with the Charities and Not-for-Profit Commission and can receive monetary donations. Mm. Um, but for us, we don't we don't look to achieve um, uh, derive an income or, or mm. for ourselves. It's mm. one hundred percent volunteer run. So there's a very low okay. cost um, base to run mm. the opera operation. All the food that comes in is rescued from supermarkets. We ask for a, a three dollar contribution for the the hampers that we give out, which are you know fruit boxes filled with fresh produce um, and perishable goods, and then mm. that money then covers insurance, petrol costs, you know, um, business registration fees every year, just the basic things that we need to be able to cover. Um, yeah. But we're not looking to, to increase that, our offering to become like a, a, a business in, of, of such. Our, our purpose is take food that's being otherwise going to be discarded, get it to people who could do with a helping hand and, and not charge a huge amount for it, just enough to cover our costs. So for three dollars someone's getting a massive box of fruit and veg. I think that's that that's the difference between that and then starting something um, like example the Reconnect project which is going to have some pretty expensive overheads in in regards to um, if we need to be purchasing spare parts and and paying for for people's time. So at the mm. moment I don't derive a wage from yeah. the Reconnect project. Uh, so, sorry I, just before we push on there because I just um is that the right spelling for the Crateful group if people are wanting to yeah. find out? Crateful, yep. okay. Yep. All right. Yeah, we'll, that's a local we'll, southern Sydney-based food rescue group awesome. that I'm All right, we'll I'm wipe that with. off and then I'll put this one back so people know who, who we're talking to. Yes, now please yeah. continue. <laughs> um, so I, I don't derive an income 
yep. from the Reconnect project yep. uh, because it's very much a startup at this point yep. in time. And, you know, in the future, it would be great um, if I could concentrate on it 100% of the time and it, yeah. and it did provide me with an income. So it's a secondary um, it's a passion project, I guess, for me yeah. at the moment. And, and the funding that I do have received goes towards paying uh, for the technician's time, paying yeah. for the spare parts, and again, paying for insurance and, and yeah. basic overheads. Very yeah. fortunate that we've got space uh, to operate that is provided to us uh, for free uh, through the Bower Reuse and Repair Centre in uh, Zetland. Okay, uh, that's okay. in their electrical um repairs workshop uh, yeah. and then office space uh, is is provided through the mobile phone spare part wholesaler that we get our, our spare parts from so I think as when you're starting out you need to look for like-minded um, organizations that you could or organizations that you have some kind of a synergy with that mm. you can then um, you know link on to and 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 be able to have them supporting you as as you're getting going but but a social enterprise very much needs to think like a business it needs to mm. operate as a business it has to have a viable funding model um, to make it sustainable because once you're established and for example once uh, you know we've got case workers now relying on us to be providing uh, devices for their clients mm. then we can't just suddenly drop off when the funding ceases so this the grant funding that I've had uh, gives us um, startup capital essentially uh, and some owns some startup capital that I put into the organization as well and that gets us going and while whilst we pilot programs like what we're doing with City of Sydney and City of Parramatta refine mm. our model and then and then build our our actual income generating um, aspect of the business which will be um, you know sale of refurbished devices and hopefully repair devices i mean the, the the big i mean the long-term plan if i, yeah, if I was to have us, one uh, if i had a vision uh <laughs> wouldn't it be great if you could go into a shopping center and get your phone repaired by the reconnect project mm, knowing that yes. you know the money you're spending on having your phone repaired is going into the, the social aim of yeah, the yeah. reconnect project so i mean my yeah. vision is to, is to have some repair facilities operating where we can provide that service to people and then also to offer training and and to find to help people to be able to um, become skilled in a different way. So yeah. seeing a transition of people that that maybe have been long term unemployed or need some way to reskill in order yeah. to become employed. So with with training, then if the reconnect project um, is able to provide that for people as well, then that's also potentially a, a an income stream. That yeah. we can generate too. So my that's my yeah. my my big plan for for you know world domination in mobile phone yeah, repairs. <laughs> Why not? Why not? I'm I'm all about it. Like I mean, I'm just uh, yeah, world domination in a good way. Uh, yeah, I think is what we really need. You know, um, and I think you know, touching on some really valuable points there is this whole element of I guess yeah, finding like-minded people or groups that can sort of I guess see your vision and have a mm. have a have a similar kind of a similar sort of vision yeah because even um even within this short time frame of finding out uh about you guys i was thinking well you know my big hairy audacious goal you know with flicks for good is to create a video streaming service that we can provide to the world for free supported by mm. ads so there'll be ad revenue and people could also donate money but, um, and one of the main reasons I want to do that is not just so that everyone can have free entertainment. It's really more so that someone who is underprivileged or perhaps, you know, is in a slum or something like that um, could actually get a device and then they could watch content but also have some good quality educational material. Yeah. I'm thinking of curating content from YouTube creators, finding people that, you know, like they you know that they're putting out stuff that's reliable because um, there's so much crazy stuff out there, you know, that um, oh, yeah. is potentially extremely dangerous. My daughter is constantly watching things. You know, she, she went through this little phase of wanting to become a mermaid and um, 
and she was uh, looking up all these like lotions and potions online that just these kids are creating. And so, you know, we would come home and then, I mean, sorry, not we would come home. It's not as, it's not as if... Uh, it's not as if she was in the house by herself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I understand. <laughs> but we would, we would be home and not pay attention to her. And then, yeah, you'd walk into the bathroom and she's got, like, all these different products she's mixing together. She's got all this stuff all over her legs and you're just like, what are you... I mean, it was, it was kind of comical, though, as well, because I was like, okay, so let's say that you do turn into a mermaid, then are you just going to hang out in the bathtub? Or yeah, how are you going to get out of the bathroom? <laughs> What's going to happen? But she's like, oh, no, I watched this Barbie thing. And she was, yeah, she at night time or something, she could, um, you know, swim. And in the daytime, she had legs and she could walk or something. I don't know. But, yeah, so basically vet the information and uh, put it on this platform. And yeah. then um, someone could have a phone and then they could get access to learning. And my big, big dream is that um, that the content would be translated into their language verbally so that's the big oh, fabulous that's the key i think to me is so that way if somebody doesn't speak english or sorry doesn't um read or write yep they can still learn they can still get some little ideas about how to better themselves and how to maybe change their position or get inspired that things are possible and go out there and make an impact in their communities and in their world so um and you know like i thought well I could foresee, like in a dream situation, let's say Flicks for Good takes off and it does well and we're able to generate money, you know, and awareness that we can use for good causes, you know, a partnership with someone like yourself could end up being something that becomes a reality where it's like, okay, well, we want to get the device to you and then we also want to get education to you in video yep. format that you can sort of, um, that you can tap into. So... Who knows? You know? Yeah, well, it's, I think it's important to to have those goals and to have those dreams and have that vision, um, mm. because that when when things are feeling like you're coming up against brick wall after brick wall after brick wall, you think, how am I mm. ever going to get this off the mm. ground? You've still got that vision um, yeah. to to hold on to, and and in that light, you know thinking like a business, being strategic, drawing up biz proper business plans and strategic mm, plans that mm. will, will keep you focused and on track um, it's because it's so easy to get distracted by pretty shiny things, you know, off in, mm. off, off in a corner somewhere and, yeah. and losing that original drive. I mean, one of the other things that I'm hope, hoping to do um, would be able to provide, you know, 12, 12 months credit, um, yeah. data and, and phone credit on the devices that we're giving out. But that's not something that the Reconnect project can can afford um, just to pay for. But if mm. we had a carrier that came mm. on board, and actually, I mean, I'm going to name them. My work, my mind's up. My mind's set on Aldi at the moment. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. My mind's set on things. Aldi yeah. because because they could be a national collection point yes. for the phones in the first place. Yes. They yes, already like do it. battery yeah. recycling. So you can yeah. drop all your household uh, batteries into Aldi. Yeah. Uh, so they could be a collection point, and if they yeah. were backing the data program for you know the 12, 12 months, they have some yeah. really good data packages, phone yeah. and data packages. So yeah. you know Aldi. There you go, Aldi. <laughs> anybody or anybody who knows that's anybody my, my who knows somebody whose sister's cousin's brother is uh, yep. works at Aldi. <laughs> At a senior level, probably not the people packing the shelves, but somebody yeah. high up. <laughs> yeah, let's. Um, That's my goal. Because yeah. I mean, that would that would just be amazing then. Because at the moment, we give the phones to the case workers, mm. uh, and then the case workers are, are having to find funding, um, you know, to to put credit onto the phone if they're giving it to one of their clients, or the client is then responsible for finding that funding. But if we can provide the whole thing, then that'd be amazing. Yeah, hundred um, percent. I love it. I love everything that um, that you're doing. It's just, uh, I think that it's really empowering. It's you know, some people at a first glance, without thinking deeply, they might not realise just how important it is. But uh, then, having said that, you take a mobile phone off someone who's probably 25 or just about of a heart attack. So yeah, you absolutely. Know. <laughs> It's, it's the first point. thing. It's the first thing we touch of a morning, and it's the last yeah. thing we touch before we go That's to bed. Exactly what you I know, was just thinking. <laughs> you you walk out of the house, got my keys, got my wallet, got my phone. You know, That's it used to just be my keys and my wallet. Now it's keys, wallet, mm. phone. Mm. You do feel like something's missing when you don't have it. Yeah. Um, 
which you know in some ways we can all we can you know look think back to the good old days when we didn't have them as kids and mm. whatnot but they as i said earlier they're here to stay and yeah. they are a beneficial tool that you know yes. they they are so Indeed. if we can reduce that divide in australia of people who have access to them and who don't then that would be yeah. great yeah so good thanks so much for joining us today i really appreciate you coming on don't be a stranger um and uh like any uh, please yeah feel free to dob in other great organizations anybody else watching i'm always looking for guests so i want to try and just keep this thing rolling and um let's all work together and um you know it's just really exciting to find people who are trying to make things better in the world so thanks so much and good 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 on you for doing what you're doing thank you thanks for the opportunity Talk soon okay, See bye. bye everybody